without any restraint You're the only way the truth and life that makes me You're listening to Spiritual Encounters with Pastor Casper McLeod. And now, here's your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters, and I am your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. Well, I've got an exciting program tonight. We're with uh, John Robertson, who's the producer for a very popular show with our friends Hagman and Hagman, Doug and Joe Hagman. So I'm going to be bringing him on in a second. Uh, he's in route, but uh, we're able to connect him here. Um, give you a scripture straight off. Mark 11:24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You know, in our world today, it's kind of like, I'll believe it when I see it. And the Lord's refers in it saying, no, you're going to have to believe it and then you're going to see it. So if we're abiding in Christ, then you need to keep singing a song of victory even before you see it. Thank the Lord Jesus in advance before you even receive it. Because think about it. After all, David spoke this way to that Nephilim giant Goliath after Goliath severely threatened and intended to absolutely annihilate him, Right. And I don't think young David ever thought once, if only we could just coexist. And maybe, you know, if he could just try to hug Goliath and, and this giant advancing him towards him with a spear and sword in hand, ready to annihilate him from the face of the earth. I mean, in the same way, I don't think that the Israelites softly sang something equivalent to Kumbaya in the background. <laughs> while observing the confrontation from their hiding places and, you know, within the clefts of the rock. And it so it amazes me uh, uh, the sort of things that we're seeing now with, like, certain well-known celebrities that are able to tell us in the most egregious hypocrisy ever um, how we should have no borders and, and with nations as well as in the multiverses and all the planets will come together, right, um, unite and, and it will end strife. And in other words, they want to instruct you to give up your you're right um, to bear arms and all the rest of it. Just hug your enemy today, right? Okay, I get it. Jesus said to love your enemies, but there's a difference between protecting your loved ones and loving your enemies. Beam me up, Jesus, right? So um, I think we, this is all part of that program managed agenda with the uh, embracing the new world order. We've got celebrity puppets lecturing, scolding us from the, the security of the private estates, which are always, by the way, protected round the clock by walls and fences, iron gates and armed security guards, right? They travel with armed bodyguards, but they want to take away your ability to defend yourself. So keep that in mind. Um, the Lord tells us, you know, in Ephesians 6.13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand within the evil day and having done all to stand. So let's recognize that. Um, that's a spiritual war. Every day you wake up, you're in a spiritual war. Paul called it the evil day that we understand we've got to be strong. Don't take your armor off. Keep it on, right? When light comes, darkness is destroyed. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. John Robinson, come on and Spread some light here. Tell us what's going on in your world. Oh, Pastor Casper, thank you so much, and, and, and greetings and God's blessings uh, be upon you and your audience, and it's just such a, a blessing and a privilege to uh, join your program here. It is a gorgeous uh, late morning up here in the northern tip of the, uh, really, of the, of the country, uh, the Olympic Peninsula, Washington State. The mountains are snow-capped. The sky is bright, beautiful blue, not, not a chemtrail to be seen. So praise God for that. And you know, Casper, uh, I just want to commend you on such a succinct and timely introduction. Uh, I would encourage the remnant church to understand and to realize that whereas we would prefer as sons and daughters of the Most High not to be in a state of war, war has been declared on us. This is not a, a, an optional thing. We're not looking at a series of choices here, brothers and sisters. 
War has been declared on Western Christendom. War has been declared on the most innocent and defenseless among us, namely our children, as demonstrated six days ago in Manchester. War has been declared on our values, on our families, on our way of life. And I would, again, respectfully submit that when we look at Isaiah or when we look at Ezekiel 33, uh, 1 through 6 in particular, yes, there is a time to engage as a watchman on the wall. And there is a time to uh, stand the horizon and uh, constantly search for the dust of the approaching enemy. But Pastor Casper, I would again submit that there is also a time to recognize that we in England, in the United States, in Canada, we have consensus at this point. We're all in agreement. War has been declared. And it's up to the men, to the warriors in the Christian church to understand that there is a time for everything. There's certainly a time to be a prayer warrior. There's a time to sequester yourself and come before the Most High. There is also a time to pray for an anointing and a mighty fire and a roar inside your heart. Pick up your sword in one hand and your Bible in the other. And Pastor Casper, I think it's time we get down with the get down. I couldn't agree more. I, I, this I, in Manchester's dear to my heart. I used to live in Manchester and Didsbury, and uh, it was most disturbing to get the news this week. I've heard from a number of old friends that are still there, um, and it makes me, you know, curious to, to kind of stand back. And as an artist, I learned you know how to get some perspective on my work as a, as a visual artist. And when we step back and see what what is really going on here, I mean, I've got friends in in UK that now call the Prime Minister. Uh, trees in May instead of Theresa May. Uh, there's there's a, a a feeling that's going on that you know things in the government are not just like over here. They're, they're not on the up and up all the time. People aren't got your best interest. Let's say, put it that way. And then we've got you know another tragedy right in the tail end of this in in, in Cairo in Egypt. Another was another 28 people that were massacred a couple of days ago. I mean, when when is this going to stop? You know, that is a very legitimate question, and I think it's a question that is of great concern. It's front and center in the hearts and minds of many uh, members of the remnant body, uh, Pastor Casper, and I believe that it will stop when we put a stop to it. Now, you know, we work and we live in this interesting community, and both you and I, brother, are so blessed to uh, work day in and day out across these new media platforms, using the power of, of digital technology to communicate in an open forum uh, heretofore never seen in the history of humanity. And it's an incredibly powerful tool. And I'm so grateful each and every day that the Lord has given us uh, power and position in this new media. But I think we need to stop and realize that you can only fight, to borrow from Alex Jones, you can only fight the info war up to a degree. And praise God, people are uh, awakening each day to the uh, true machinations of this world, understanding that uh, the enemy, that Satan has been given temporary dominion over the earth. The world still belongs to the Lord God, Jesus Christ, but Satan has temporary dominion, as Scripture indicates. And when we look at the battle that is raging across the planet. And I would really encourage folks, again, in England or in the U.S. or joining us from New Zealand, from France, from, from, from anywhere you happen to catch this program, this is truly a global conflict. And some would argue, Pastor Casper, that it is a conflict between a globalist agenda, a borderless uh, love will get us through the day fallacy, and what some call nationalism or sovereignty or patriotism, et cetera. But I would again submit to you and to your uh, audience, Pastor Casper, that this is really the battle that has raged. It's the battle of evermore, and it has existed since the beginning of humanity. And that battle is being fought in the spirit world. It rages around us every minute of every day. And I personally believe, Pastor, that because God loves us as much as he does, he chooses to mask that battle from our five senses so that we are not inundated every moment of every day 
with what I imagine would be some very frightening optics. So I'm calling upon your audience today to join us in this conversation and understand that it's not a battle between Le Pen and Macron in France or between Hillary and Trump in the United States or whatever Theresa May or uh, Angela Merkel are cooking up in, uh, in Western Europe and in the United Kingdom. This is a battle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Pastor? I, I'm so glad you pointed that out because that's precisely what we see in Scripture. This is what's going on, and it is coming to a head. I believe it will stop because it, it is a fact that the Lord Jesus is coming back. And, uh, you know, the New World Order guys think they're going to have a New World Order. Well, they are. It's going to be a New World Order, but not the one they think they're going to get. It's the one that the Lord Jesus is going to put in place, and it's going to be awesome. New heaven and a new earth. In the meantime, um, we're to, to do what he's called us to do. The sh uh, Christ's love everywhere we go, to, to cast out demons in his name and, and heal the sick. This is what he wants for his church. You grew up in a very um, unique experience, both in um, experiencing the secular and the Christian music world as your family was involved in um, some major concert production. Maybe you can tell us a little bit how that impacted your, your life and your perceptions. Oh, Pastor, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, folks, for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with uh, the work that I have been so incredibly blessed to do uh, for the kingdom and for our brothers and sisters all over the world. My name, again, is John Robertson. Uh, I am the producer of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Uh, you can find us across many, many digital platforms, hagmanreport.com, two ends on Hagman. Uh, we broadcast 15 hours of live original content a week, Monday through Friday, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern, hagmanreport.com. But as Pastor Casper indicated, prior to my tenure with the Hagman and Hagman Report, I spent 16 years in Hollywood in uh, feature film, television production, with uh, what you might call a minor degree in commercial production and even some music videos in my earlier days. And prior to that, uh, I grew up in the music scene. My dad is John Robertson Sr. He is the founder and owner of Celebration Concerts, celebrationconcerts.com, and also the director of Spirit West Coast, spiritwestcoast.com, which uh, for about 15 years was the uh, epicenter for West Coast Christian music festivals. So to touch on what you uh, said, Pastor Casper, from the late 70s, from the time when the church was really uncertain what to do with the concept of Christian rock music, when Christian rock was considered uh, an affront to the church writ large and an oxymoron, uh, to mm. be sure, we uh, began to do these little gigs out of a local church in my hometown in California, in Northern California, and we began to bring in, Pastor Casper, these Jesus rockers. You know, these guys, many of them had... Uh, had literally, you know, put the bong down and picked up the Bible, uh, in some cases, six months, a year, two years uh, previous to our uh, bringing them in to play some rock and roll. And, and a lot of these guys were really on fire for Jesus. They had been searching for years and years, and in some cases, decades, uh, moving through the, the cultural miasma of, of secular music, uh, searching for, for that which is real, searching for something true. You know, that's what good rock music is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be having the guts to be a rebel and stand in the face of the status quo and do your own thing. And many Christians at the time would balk at that, uh, thinking that a rebellious spirit is, you know, unbecoming to the church. It's, it's, it's anti-biblical. But Pastor Casper, I would suggest to you, sir, that Jesus Christ himself was a rebel in capital letters. He stood in the face of the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He told them that they were of their father, the devil. And so when I look at the juxtaposition of growing up through the 1980s and the early 1990s, we took a lot of heat from the mainstream church. In many cases, we did not receive a lot of support from the mainstream church. My dad built the business uh, off of the coffee table, ultimately into a festival that would bring in twenty, twenty-five thousand people, 
from the Western United States for a three day event. You know, we'd feature 25, 30 different artists gigging on seven different stages. And, you know, the thing that means the most to me when I look back on those early days in the music scene is the reality, folks, is if you want to stand on the front line of this spiritual fight, you've got to meet people where they are at. You cannot expect, you see, Pastor Casper, the book of Acts is probably my favorite book in the Bible. And it's because it's, it's a proactive forward motion book, the fivefold ministry being taken out into the people, finding the lost where they're at and loving on them because you are always humbled and always mindful that without the grace of Jesus Christ, you and I were the lost. And therefore, we should have love for our brethren and be out searching for them. But what's happened, uh, Pastor, in the last 20 years is the church has has abdicated their authority. They've absconded from their proper position, and they have flipped the script on the book of Acts. Instead of being out ministering to the winos, ministering to the women selling themselves on the streets in places like London, like Los Angeles, etc., They've built these palatial campuses with indoor swimming pools and cyber lounges and yoga and coffee kiosks in the foyer and on and on it goes because they're trying to attract the lost. They're trying to magnetize the lost to a single location. Pastor Casper, when you look at Christian rock music in the 1970s and 80s moving up through the 90s, the reality is I have seen with my own eyes and I've felt the Holy Spirit in my heart where tens of thousands of kids have made a commitment to Jesus Christ at a rock concert, and many of these kids wouldn't have put so much as one toe across the foyer of a church. I couldn't agree more with what you've just said. And uh, going back a moment where you, you talked about the Lord Jesus, Yeshua being a, a, a revolutionary. Um, he was quite revolutionary. And it always seemed curious to me that why he one time healed the blind man um, using mud and spittle until I came across some research uh, I was doing on in the Jewish book of Mishnah, which is basically their oral traditions written down. Um, it says specifically, do not try to heal a blind man using mud or spittle or injecting wine in his eyes. So apparently he was going, look guys, this is what I think of your oral traditions. I'm going to take some mud, I'm going to take some spit, watch this. Touch the blind man, go wash, and he came away seeing. What does he want for us? I mean, the the, the standard and the gap, he, he wants us to call us to, to come out, the love, you know, all people minister healing and miracles in the almighty name of Jesus. The book of Acts is a continuing act. You're absolutely right. At the um, recent um, conference we did uh, together with Joe and, and, and Doug Hagman, um, you were one of the, the featured speakers with Pastor Paul Begley. You shared some um, interesting, very compelling evidence about what was going on in Hollywood. And at one point, you even um, showed that you'd seen, I think you said you, you, you were there witnessing a woman named Katy Perry um, when she was leading people in worship. What happened with that? How, how is this unfolding here? You know, Pastor, that's an excellent question. And I really hope that the Lord will frame my remarks at this very moment to minister to the young aspiring artists who uh, have been blessed with that first seed of faith. Because as you know, brother, being such a talented old school rock and roller yourself, artistry is one of the most beautiful and profound things uh, in anyone's life, be they Christian or, or still one of the lost sheep. When you realize that you have that creative energy, when you have that creative component within you, over the 45 years that I've been alive, a good 35 of which I've been moving around through various avenues of the entertainment industry, what I have seen time and time again is if you are a truly creative person, man, you just want to plug in your guitar and wail, 
or you stay up till four o'clock in the morning, pounding away at the keys and, and, and the spirits moving within you to the point where you're not even sure what you wrote until the next morning. And when you read it, you think, wow, did, did I do that? <laughs> or even if you're hanging out in the inner city and you're, you know, looking both ways for the cops, cause you know how to put these amazing 30 and 40 foot burners together with, with a backpack full of spray paint. Whatever, you're, and by the way, I'm not promoting criminal behavior here, but I've lived in LA and San Francisco and Oakland for a long time, and there's some amazing street artists out there. So, whatever your medium is, I've seen it so many times, uh, Pastor Casper. People without that catharsis, without being able to get what is in them out, they will oftentimes implode. And then the drugs come in, the alcohol comes in, the the, uh, the perverted, orgiastic type of sexual behavior comes in, and the desire to do exactly what a major component of the Gospels instructs us not to do, which is to store up your treasures on this earth. And what did Jesus admonish us not to do? He said, do not store it up here where it can rust, where it can be stolen by thieves, but rather store your treasures in eternity. And that's the key when you look at somebody like Katy Perry. Now, I try to be very judicious and diplomatic because my dad did do business with her in her younger years when she was, as she puts it, a quote-unquote gospel singer. Uh, I think she trivializes her time in the Christian music industry because she feels that it probably doesn't bode well for her public persona today. But what happened, and folks, this is not my opinion. I'm using her verbiage. Katy Perry is on record saying, and I'm, this, there's a little bit of paraphrase here, but I'll get it pretty close to verbatim. Quote, I wanted to be the Amy Grant of Christian music, but when I realized that wasn't going to happen, I sold my soul to the devil. Now, Pastor Casper, I know this to be a fact. For many of your uh, audience who may not understand, Luciferian witchcraft, and there's many different brands, whether it's Druidic, whether it's Wicca, whether it's Sabbatean witchcraft, uh, uh, Kabbalistic witchcraft, or a combination of all of those. Multi-generational witchcraft in the U.S., in the United Kingdom, is divided up and structured much like an army. There are ranks, there's regional authority, and it's a very organized scene. And part of that army, part of legion, if you will, are what I call demonic brokers. Now, that's my nomenclature, but there are principalities out there who have been given authority by Satan to offer a contract to aspiring artists. And the contract is simple. It's just like the way Satan tempted Jesus when he said, you bow down before me and I'll give you this entire world. And of course, we know Jesus rebuked him. Satan's lucky Jesus didn't fireball him. <laughs> but... What happens, Pastor Casper, and it happens at a very young, impressionable age, and for some reason, 17 seems to be where a lot of people make this, the, the, really, the most horrible mistake you could possibly make with your life, to take that which is eternal and that which technically belongs to God. You didn't make yourself. The Lord God Almighty created you fiercely in his image. These kids, Pastor Casper, there are a number of different ways to go about it as far as protocol. But the bottom line is there are principalities out there who have been given the authority to negotiate a contract. And without getting too far into the weeds on deliverance, you, you have to willingly give these demonic influences and powers. You have to give them contractual authority over you. And so many young artists at the age of 17 do so. And I'll, I'll make this my concluding remark for the moment. They do so at 17, and Pastor Casper, you know, and in fact, you hung out with some of these people back in the day. Folks, just do a quick search on Google of how many big-time rock stars have died at the age of 27. You know, in L.A., we call it the curse of 27. I mean, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, the list goes on and on. With Katy Perry, what we've seen is a clear, probably the most clear example of demonic brokerage in action. She gave away her eternal life with God to store her treasures here on this earth where they can rust or be stolen by thieves. 
As you and I had um, chatted in the past, um, th th there is certainly an agenda in place. And I, I think I remember mentioning to you and, and the Hagmans, um, maybe it was over dinner, how um, I was walking down the hallway when I was a young recording artist for Atlantic Records. And uh, the door was ajar to one of the offices at the studio. And I heard my name and I slowed down. Not that I'm one to, you know, give to eavesdrop in, but since they called my name out, I, I stopped and, and I listened. And I was a baby Christian at the time. And I heard my management talking with the record executives and someone said, well, if you can't get Casper to take the drugs, how in the world are you going to get control over him? That was the day I decided it was time to go play for the Lord. Uh, this is the sort of thing that goes on in, in, in secular music, sadly. There's a lot of that sort of thing going on that you just described. So, that and worse, you know, um, while we're there, I might as well um, share this. Um, my, my producer at the time was Ahmet Erdogan, who was the legendary um, um, CEO, that started, one of the people that primarily started Atlantic Records and um, I, I don't think I realized at the time, Ahmet's um, father was an ambassador from Turkey, so he, he was of the um, his Muslim faith. And periodically he would say, oh, we're going to go to dinner after the session tonight, and then he'd get a phone call and go, oh, sorry guys, I've got to, I've got to fly to Washington to see you, you know, and eat at the White House tonight or something like that. Uh, I was one occasion I recall where he... Um, he, he wanted us all to go to dinner at something called the Hellfire Club. And as a baby Christian, I thought, eating dinner at a place called the Hellfire Club doesn't sound like a good idea to me. I just hit a check in my spirit, so I made an excuse why I couldn't go. But the rest of the band went along. And the next day, I asked them, and we were back in Studio A, and I asked them, you know, so um, how was it last night? And they described going to dinner with Ahmed at a s and dinner club. I mean, just really bizarre stuff. So I think maybe you can share a little bit more light on that one, because that's one of the ways we've seen in Hollywood um, and, and in the music entertainment entertainment industry altogether, right? It's kind of an Alistair Crowley thing going on there. If they can get people into a compromising place and they've got film and videos or whatever, they now own them and they control their life. Because if you don't do what we say, we're going to put this out and destroy your career, right? Indeed, that's exactly uh, what is going down in Los Angeles. Now, I'll cover uh, a fairly broad landscape here with you, Pastor Casper, and we'll, we'll move through this quickly. Um, there is an episode. Now, Pastor Casper, you and I have both had the blessing and the honor of working with our friend and our brother, uh, John B. Wells, over at Caravan to Midnight. So I want to preface this by saying for all of your audience, if this is of interest to you, uh, I did my first Caravan to Midnight was in the summer of 2015, and I think it's episode 339, if I remember correctly. So that's caravantomidnight.com, episode 339. It's a fantastic show uh, for those of you not familiar with it. Um, it's, uh, it's a $5 a month subscription, but in my humble opinion, very, very worth uh, one cup of Starbucks coffee. Anyway, I digress. The point is, to understand, Pastor Casper, what's going on in Hollywood with the blackmail with the pedophilia, with the, at times, uh, rape and murder and dismemberment of the defenseless, okay? We must understand that Hollywood is a satanic construct through and through, from A to Z and from Z to A. And I often make this remark. If I were to suggest to your uh, audience today, you know, why don't we pack a picnic lunch and let's just head on down to the church of Satan and hang out for a while. You know, why not have a few egg salad sandwiches over at the church of Satan? How's that sound? I would be rebuked by most of the people listening to our remarks today, but I could easily invite almost any of them to join me to go see a film. Okay. And so I want to start there to, to reiterate that the danger, the toxicity, the poison of Hollywood just in the presentation at your local multiplex is that if the right don't get you, the left one will. You don't have to go to 
that film Raw that was made a big screaming debut at Sundance this past January, a, a, a film that really celebrates cannibalism and cannibalism among teenagers. If you can imagine, that's how depraved uh, the celebrated content coming out of Hollywood has become. Many of your audience, many among us today would never go to that type of film. But even the most benign romantic comedy, Pastor Casper, instructs the viewers to solve their human problems with humanist solutions. So it's a very deceptive platform. And I want your listeners to understand that many of the people who are uh, who have become fabulously wealthy and who uh, have soaked up the spotlight for, in some cases, decades, they are controlled by the inner machinations of Hollywood. And I'll give you a quick primer on the control mechanism. Folks, the studios, there's six major studios in Hollywood. Uh, there used to be seven, but there's six majors. And they are uh, controlled by the finance of the of making these products, which is, of course, incredibly expensive. So whereas when you're in the executive vice president of development's office for Disney or Universal or wherever, you may feel that you're at the upper echelon of decision making. But that's actually just an elaborate puppet show. The people making the decisions are the people paying the bills. And that buck stops, if you'll pardon the pun, with the international banking cartels, the same as it does in international arms sales, the petrodollar the narco trade, et cetera. Hollywood runs from the same financial spigot as these other uh, massive problems on the planet. So when you've got hundreds of millions of dollars tied up in a project, the need to exercise ultimate control, tyrannical control over the lives and the careers of the people who are selling the product. You see, a big A-list actor is a selling point. People go, how often have you folks heard, yeah, you know, let's go down and see the new Denzel picture. You know, they don't even say the title of the film. Hey, you know what? Let's go. Let's go check out that new Angelina Jolie thing. People say that type of stuff all the time. Well, Hollywood's well aware of that. And that's why the biggest paycheck on any production goes to the quote unquote A-list talent. They are the point of sale. They must be controlled, Pastor Casper. And the way that they do it, and I saw this firsthand when I worked for Disney, at, a, at an impressionable young age, and 12 is really a key age here, I had a friend recently inform me that that could, I haven't completely researched this, but that it could be because in traditional Jewish faith, 12 is the noted age between bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah. It's when a child is recognized to become a young adult in, in the Jewish faith, which is the root of our Christian faith. So so at a young age, Pastor Casper, they want to get these kids in as many compromising positions as possible. And when we met uh, last month at the Awaken to the Shaken conference, you may recall in my presentation that I uh, implicated Brian Singer, the big-time A-list director who uh, is, has been at the helm of the X-Men franchise. I want to make this point very clear. Brian Singer has been well-documented as having orgiastic parties, uh, and he's got a place in the Hollywood Hills and one in Malibu, where upwards of 500 naked men are running around the swimming pool doing drugs. Okay, pharmaceuticals are huge. And many of these uh, people have come forward ex post facto and said, look, I was only 15 years old. I was only 16 years old. And so with a proper, or not proper is the wrong word, with the with the right combination of pharmaceuticals, a little bit of alcohol, a lot of peer pressure, a lot of career pressure, they will get these young up-and-coming stars into very compromising positions. So you may not have homosexual inclinations, but they will get you tuned up on drugs and dangle the carrot of fame and of, and of fortune in front of your face, and they will get you uh, on camera – in orgiastic behavior, uh, multiple partners, in some cases, uh, you know, animal dismemberment, bloodletting, there are reports of cannibalism. And even if the actual cannibalism is not occurring, the consumption of human flesh, we see with Marina Abramovic in the WikiLeaks data dumps last fall 
that they are spirit cooking and doing these spirit cooking parties to to promote the spirit of cannibalism, even though they may not exactly be consuming human flesh. What they do, folks, is they get you on camera and, and engaged in this type of behavior. And from that moment on, Pastor Casper, they own you. You will do the scripts they tell you to do. You will uh, support the charities they tell you to get behind. You will absolutely support whatever political platform and ideology that they instruct because till your dying day, they can destroy your career with one simple little piece of video. And that's how it works. It's most disturbing. Um, and uh, I know from our friend Ross Distar, you know, he talks about this as well. I mean, a, a lot of this. Again, this goes back to what we said at the beginning of this program. This is a spiritual war, these, these things. And I found it was very um, – someone sent me a, a, a video clip to look at this week, which was really disturbing. It, up in New York, now that you've got um, people of uh, alternative lifestyles going into the public libraries and having a time of reading for the children, the, you know, f uh, three, four, five-year-olds, basically indoctrinating them into, you know, an alternative lifestyle idea. Uh, these young, impressionable minds, in fact, uh, as my studies uh, is into the epigenetics, um, the, the, the human brain isn't even really fully developed until the, the early 20s, which is very sad to see. This is almost like a naughty playbook thing, you know, um, take over the world in a generation by, you know, taking away at the university level, take away people's by ability to have critical thinking. They're, they're basically a lot of zombies running around now, not able to, to see the programming that they've been indoctrinated with. So these are most um, disturbing ideas that are floating around that you're sharing here. Uh, I know in my, my last book, um, I did mention in one of the chapters about Hollywood's contribution to the the whole um, ET phenomena that's, uh, you know, the UFO phenomena that's unfolding here as well. So let's just call it what it is, the great deception. And we, we keep in mind that, um, uh, you know, the, men, the movies about the men in black showing up, well, we know, you know, some of our friends now have been uh, approached by the men in black government men telling them to stop talking about the dangers of CERN or you're, you're giving away too much information, you're destroying our our um, theology of uh, <clears throat> Darwinism, all the rest of it. So I, I look back and I, I saw that uh, even in, back in the 60s, you had, um, and you mentioned how they were using comedy <clears throat> and like the um, science fiction comedy shows like My Favorite Martian, popular here. Um, here's a guy that's uh, supposedly from, from Mars. It's coming to... to um, <clears throat> hang out with this uh, newspaper report. He's got telepathic abilities. He can read and influence people. He can even stop people in motion using his, uh, his finger. People are all looking for power, right? They're looking for, in the wrong places, They're looking for power in the wrong places. We're, we're here to present the power of God, like in the book of Acts, the, the true power, the, the power that's more powerful than anything else in this entire world. So um, this is really... The, the more we expose, like I said before, you know, we turn on the light, darkness is destroyed. So we're going to let a light shine. And the more we talk about this and the shows like the Hagmans and our friend John D. Wells and all the rest of our, the, our friends in this group of speakers that are going out and, and, and shedding some light and, and letting people be aware of what's really happening here behind the scenes. So um, <clears throat> I... Go ahead. Your thoughts. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. The, 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 and just a special thanks to, to Brandon, your producer. We do have a, a little bit of a delay uh, on our show here this afternoon, folks. But uh, Pastor Casper, you know, I've been chewing the inside of my cheek the last 60 seconds listening to your remarks because uh, I want to encourage those joining us here uh, with – I'm going to use an optic. I'm going to use an image, a, a, a word picture – most of us have seen an aerial photograph of the freeway systems in L.A. They look like this, this, this uh, tangled mess of asphalt ribbons all tied together, a bunch of, a bunch of asphalt bows 
laid one on top of the other. And to people who have never lived in Southern California, I think it sometimes looks a little bit intimidating. You know, some of these uh, freeways are, you know, 40, 50, 60 feet up off the ground with another two freeways running underneath. That word image is a lot like the level of deception and corruption in our world today. So to, to be clear, when you talk about shining the light, folks, you will never untangle the deceptive knot, this mess that is the satanic uh, Luciferian agenda, not only emanating from Hollywood, but from Silicon Valley, from D.C., from Madison Avenue, from Wall Street, from the Pentagon, and the list goes on and on. All of the power structures in the United States and in England as well have been completely corrupted by Satan. And so rather, I would encourage everyone hearing our words today, rather than try to spend thousands of hours untangling that big mess of freeways to go back to that image, you need to understand, folks, that whereas there are tens of thousands upon thousands of lies spun out by Hollywood. You know, I sometimes call it the unholy trinity, Pastor Casper. You've got Madison Avenue that cooks it up. They tell you, you're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not skinny enough. You have no sex appeal. You smell bad. You're stupid. But we've got the solution. Madison Avenue cooks it up. Wall Street funds it. And then Hollywood blasts it out to the world. And what it's designed to do is make you feel worthless to make you feel inadequate, and then to use the Hegelian dialectic to create the problem and then solve the problem so that you buy their products, you buy their service, you buy their political ideology, et cetera, et cetera. There's only one thing that you all got to do is realize that the truth left on this planet is simply this. Jesus Christ is the son of Almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the little G God, Allah, the God of the moon, which is one of the most powerful demonic principalities in the history of humanity. I'm talking about God Almighty. Jesus Christ is his son, born of a virgin birth, who led an innocent life of healing, of teaching, of casting out spirits, healing the sick, ministering, feeding the masses. And it is under his blood that you can be redeemed and to, and to, by accepting this free gift, you've accepted an eternity with the Lord God who created you. You see, Pastor Casper, where this gets confusing for people is they, they don't understand. They, they have no start point to work from. Folks, Hollywood is simply the machine that is very uh, efficient at cranking out satanic counterfeits of that which God gave us, and some of the obvious ones, okay? God gave sex to consummate love between man and woman and to procreate. And I think, Pastor Casper, I think God's got almost a kind of a cool sense of humor because whereas sex is regarded as one of the most pleasurable things uh, two people can engage in, raising a child is probably the most difficult thing that two people can engage in. So God really knew what he was doing. But of course, Satan does what? He spins it off and gives us pornography. Another one that I think is a great example, God gave us the, the benefit and the blessing of narcotics. When you've got a compound fracture and a bone sticking out of your ankle, you know, a good hard pop of some kind of opiate in your brain is exactly what you need. And that's why I believe God gave us that, that, uh, uh, abundance from the earth, but then Satan counterfeits it. He develops heroin a hundred years ago, and it's the biggest drug epidemic in the United States in the history of drug, drug epidemics in the United States. So folks, those are kind of cheesy examples, but, but Satan counterfeits that which was given to us for our edification, for good. And all Hollywood is, is it's the machine that blasts it out to the world. And it does so in many, many layers of trickery and different layers appeal to different people. So back to that, that, that image of the tangled ribbons of asphalt in Los Angeles, where it seems like there's these tens of thousands of cars going every which way. And, and my goodness, that's what the devil's agenda is like, whether you're trying to parse through politics, 
whether you're trying to parse through finance or the entertainment industry, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, et cetera. So the start point, folks, is to, is to pray what I think is probably the most profound prayer, aside from, aside from the Lord's Prayer, that I've ever heard in my life. And I give a tip of the hat to our good friend Steve Quayle, uh, stevequayle.com. He said that the most powerful prayer one who is lost and hurting can say is Jesus help. That's where you've got to start. Pastor? I couldn't agree more. You know, it says in the scriptures and our holy guidebook to the supernatural, in the last days, many will depart, many will be deceived, many will depart from the faith and give over to lying um, doctrines of devils and men. Today we've got the seeker-friendly movement. There's no seeker-friendly message anywhere in all the scriptures, but we've got these MAGA uh, mythic uh, church buildings now, like just as said, instead of going into the world and sharing the gospel, they're expecting the world to come to them because of, you know maybe they're offering the best coffee in town um, or the kind of perks or whatever. There's a, a very popular uh, preacher in Atlanta that said last uh, December that, you know, you don't actually have to believe in the virgin birth, apparently. This is what this man said. You don't have to believe in the virgin birth to be a Christian. Yeah, you do. But uh, he apparently he said that because he just wants people to come to his, his mega church and give them his, you know, give the ties and offering to him so he can build a bigger building now. We're, we're in the last days, just as you said, um, you know, the guys that met in Jekyll Island, um, everybody that was opposed to that Federal Reserve apparently got lured onto the Titanic and they sank the Titanic for, for a purpose and reason with all of it. I think we're down to the lost moments here um, in more than one way. John, would you be so kind to, to lead people in a prayer? Because I think right now there are probably people listening to us and they just need to make their peace with the Lord Jesus. Pastor Casper, I would be honored to, to lead us in a prayer. And, you know, before I do so, I want to remind uh, folks, that the proper way to pray is to humble yourself before the Lord God. You humble yourself. That's why we hit our knees. That's why we bow our heads. We're showing respect to He who created us. And this has been so profound in my life. Not only He who created us, but loves us enough to give us free will and loves us enough to give us a, a just a, a small divine spark of the creativity that he knows and loves so well. Not only did he create the earth and he created all the wonders on our planet, but he gave us, Pastor Casper, he gave us that little divine spark of creativity ourselves to create a novel, to create an amazing guitar solo, to create something that moves other people's souls okay, that, that touches like a deep part of their spirit. And he also gave us the divine spark of creativity to create other human beings. That's how much God loves his children, okay? He didn't reserve the power and the, and the profundity and the eminence of creativity just for himself, which he could have easily done. But he chose to give us just a small spark of that divine conflagration of creativity, and he gave it to each and every person listening to us today. And the other thing I want to add before I pray is this, is that, you know, when you look at all of the problems and all of the despair across the planet, it is so easy to lose hope. And my favorite scripture in the entire Bible is Hebrews 11.1, 1, and it instructs us, and this goes back to your introduction, Pastor Casper. It, sa it tells us that faith is the substance of all things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen or unseen, depending on your, the, what Bible you're reading. Let's, let's, let's take a moment with this. Faith is the substance of all things hoped for. What are your hopes, brothers and sisters? Is it to repair a relationship in your family? Is it to, to rediscover the music you left behind and pull your guitar out of the closet? You know, it's been sitting there behind the vacuum cleaner for 15 years. Is it to start banging away on your laptop late at night you know, and, and, and get those first few thousand clunky words out so you can get back in the groove. Maybe it's just to have the courage to say to somebody at the gas station next to you that, hey, man, Jesus loves you. That's, that's sometimes like the hardest thing to do. So, so faith is the substance of all things hoped for, 
But what else is it? It's the evidence of things not seen. And this is kind of a cheesy word image, but I loved what you said in your introduction because, folks, Scripture informs us that if we are faithful in these little tiny things that God blesses us with, and remember, folks, a lot of times those blessings come in the form of a challenge. God loves us so much that he's not going to let us roll out on status quo day in and day out. He will challenge you. And when you man up and you get on your spiritual battle rattle and you meet those challenges, then he will make you faithful in greater things still. And, you know, so when, when I think of this often, Pastor Casper, I think uh, if I'm a little frog, you know, we've got that whole, that whole Trump trained Pepe thing. So let's say I'm a little Pepe frog right? Want to make America great again. And I'm on a lily pad and I'm, I'm out in the middle of the swamp. The way my faith walk has worked, God will, will show me the lily pad in front of me, but, but I have to jump. I have to have the, the, the courage and the faith and the trust in him to jump to that lily pad. Pastor Casper, he doesn't show you the 30 more lily pads you have to hit to get to the other side of the swamp. But he loves us enough to show us the next one. And that's what we need to do as the remnant body today. We need to jump. The time for complacency, the time for, for you know, a, a coziness in your megachurch, that time is over, man. This is a war. And I want to say one more thing quickly, and then I will pray. And, brother, I really appreciate you letting me preach here a little bit. Folks, we at the Hagman and Hagman Report, our good friend, Pastor Casper, uh, all of the di- different platforms that we move around and move through and congregate around, we believe so strongly in liberty, in the liberty of our country, in the liberty of our souls for our brothers and sisters over in the UK. We believe that liberty is so incredibly uh, important and so incredibly valuable. Why? So that we can own guns, so that we can you know, pop off and speak our minds, so we can congregate without fear of retribution. That's all part of it, but the, but the way that I know that God is a patriot is because, Pastor, without that liberty, if we allow ourselves to be overrun by radical Islam, if we allow ourselves to be overrun by this leftist communist agenda that would, that would uh, uh, bring our children up to believe in the preeminence of the state and to eschew the omnipotence and the omniscience and the omnipresence of God, if we allow that to happen— and we, we, we give away our liberty, then we have given away the single greatest gift that God gave us. Because, Pastor, without that liberty, without that personal freedom and independence, how can we make a conscious decision to follow our Lord Christ Jesus? So that being said, let's pray. Father Jolly God, well said, and uh, as we just went through this weekend of a uh, holiday uh, of the Memorial Day, remembering those that laid down their lives, you know, the ones that laid down their life for freedom. Don't let them roll over in their grave and grieve here. John, lead us in a prayer of salvation. Amen, brother. Father God, I just come before you now with a repentant spirit for the sanctification that you're still bringing forward in my life. Lord God, I'll state it right now. Uh, with ev- to everyone listening, sometimes I let you down, Lord, and I drop the ball. And I am truly sorry for the times that I fail. But Father God, thank you so much for infusing my spirit with courage and with faith and with understanding, Lord, that when all of us try to drive the car, we crash it, Father God. And whereas at 15, 16, 17 years old, those are little fender benders, when you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, Father, without your hands on the steering wheel of our lives, these are turning into 10, 12, 20-car pileups, blood on the streets. And so many listening today, Lord God, they feel like they're dragging a huge chain of sin and of disappointment, hopelessness and despair. And many are looking toward President Donald Trump to fix it all. And Lord God, we as Christians, we know that he is not the Messiah. We know that he is not going to solve the problems that only you and your Holy Spirit can, Lord God. And I pray for all of the men and women out there who are sticking a needle in their arm. I pray for all of the people who can't put the bottle down. I pray for the people who, who are, are, are consumed with pornography every day. I pray for the people who are so, so lost and so 
uh, uh, consumed by neuroses that they cannot tell the truth. I pray for the people who enter a room and they have no power whatsoever. They chameleonize to wherever they're at so that people will love them, so that they'll have the sense of being accepted by this world. I pray for all of these people, folks. I pray, to, I pray, Lord God, that you would do what only your Holy Spirit can do. Pastor Casper and I can spin out the words, Father. We can try to tell it as best we can, but the anointing only comes from you. And I pray, Lord God, that this conversation today touches certain people in a way that Pastor Casper and I will never know on this earth, but perhaps we'll know when we meet you, Lord God, in heaven. And for those that are lost on the streets of L.A., the streets of London, or even in the little towns all across this land, that you would touch them, Father, specifically, individually in their hearts in a manner that I can't even begin to understand, but that you know so well because you know even the number of hairs on their heads, Lord God. There are people out there in pain. There are people out there who are lonely. I know what loneliness is like. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Show them that you can come into their lives and that you can bring to them better friends than they could ever find on their own, Lord God. And I pray, Father, for an anointing on Pastor Casper. I pray for an anointing on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Lord, we cannot do this without you. We cannot do this without you. And I pray for those who've heard our voices today and they know that they're in sin. They know that if they're being completely honest with themselves, they are not a happy person. They know no joy. Minister to them, Father God. We can, we can move the ball down the field, but Lord, you're the one that's got to take it into the end zone. So I pray for the lost souls. I pray that those who have been moved by this conversation would simply bow their head, humble themselves, confess their sins, cry out, Jesus, help, and acknowledge that it is by the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of this world, and it is by his stripes that we are healed, and that, and that those desperately in need of your Holy Spirit and, and, and your ministry, Lord God, that they would come broken to the cross, that they would have the gut to come in itty-bitty pieces so that you can rebuild them, so that you can take the victims of Satan, Father God, and weaponize them into a powerful tool for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And it is in his name and by his authority I lift this prayer up to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen and hallelujah. Thank you so much, John Robinson, and we'll uh, be looking for you on uh, Hagman and Hagman. And uh, I know I'm going to be joining you next month on the program. So looking forward to that. And uh, God bless everyone. And we'll see you next week for another spiritual encounter. America, won't you wake up? America, all your leaders corrupt. America. America, won't you stand up? America, before you're bankrupt. America, what will the Lord say? There's still the time to turn your wicked ways. If you humble yourself, God will hear you. America, won't you wake up? America, are your leaders corrupt?